We've got Airmail from God with today's reading from the Gospel of John. Here's your host, Ted Gray. Well, thank you, sir. I don't deserve such a distinguished introduction. I can't do miracles, can't foretell the future, and have no easy solutions. Only hoping to find truth we can believe and then live by. And all that living still has to be done by you and me, as even Paul said. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Well, we're going through the Gospel of John verse by verse, and last time we were looking at Jesus preaching his congregation down to twelve by saying some unbelievably radical things, and they're not my favorite things. When he said to them, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. John 6, 66-69 Many good principles can be observed here to live by. The few will stay. And who are they? The ones who appreciate the words of eternal life, the words of Jesus who spoke to us in these last days, which are recorded in the Gospels and in the Epistles. The ones who have the love of the truth, they will stay. By contrast, sermons, stories, experiences, music, and allegorized Old Testament scriptures are not exactly the same. They are not the words of eternal life. For example, if allegorized sermons from the Old Testament are words of eternal life, then Jesus came and taught for nothing. Really? If allegorized sermons from the Old Testament are words of eternal life, then Jesus came and taught for nothing because the rabbis had already allegorized the Old Testament to death. Peter already had all that from the beginning, and the last thing the church needs today is more allegorized sermons from the Old Testament. Another observation we can make is that even God in the flesh, just by the words of life, could not hold a large following. By contrast, when he performed spectacular miracles, when he gave people their health back, and when he gave them food, there were many, 20,000 in one count. But that's called rice Christianity. You give people rice and they will come to Jesus. Apparently, but not really. Same as today. The health, wealth, and prosperity doctrine, which is mostly allegorized Old Testament scripture or law or old wine in new wineskins, which gushes from many pulpits, books, TV, radio, seminars, and conferences, will fill churches. It is that error which we are told in many places, but it will not work to bring people to God or to bring sheep into the church. All we can bring into the church is goats by offering anything other than the words of life. It's a clear violation of scripture to bring unbelievers into the church because the assembly meeting, the offering, and the Lord's table is for believers only. But the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil in the church today. The few who were real sheep were represented by Peter when he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. John 6:68 6, and 69. We have come to believe and to know. This shows another principle. It takes more than the words of life to believe and to know. Just like in the natural, it takes male and female to make a new life. So in the spiritual, it takes two to make a new birth, or it takes two to make a new creation, or a son of God. It takes the words of life and the Holy Spirit. That's why it says born of water and spirit. Peter knew something about coming to believe. He said later that he is writing to those who have obtained like precious faith with us in 1 Peter 1, 2, who have obtained faith. That's how it comes, if it comes. What is faith anyway? It is a product or fruit of the Holy Spirit, we are told. It comes by hearing the word. 
It is received by people, not produced by people. Faith is something supernatural. It comes out of heaven from God and it is received by some people on this planet Earth as a free gift, as it says. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. What is the gift of God? The faith through which the elect are saved. That's the gift of God. Why did the many other disciples not walk with him anymore? They saw and heard exactly the same thing. The difference is God in heaven, using his spirit. He alone makes the difference, as Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. John 6, 44. And it's the Spirit that gives life. It's the Spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing, yes. And he said, No one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father, in verse 65. Those who preach the Arminian gospel really should call themselves philosophy professors because that is all it is, the philosophy of men which robs people of their prize in many ways. I really was anticipating to put this subject of God's predestination behind us, but Jesus keeps bringing it up. And airmail from God does not believe in jumping over and avoiding difficult subjects in order to sell you our pet doctrines, because only Judgment Day will reveal whether man's work is good or bad, according to 2 Corinthians 5.10. So here we go. The next verses read, Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. For it was he who would betray him, and being one of the twelve. Verse 70 and 71. What's the point of these two verses? I think he's reinforcing his point. He's saying one of those twelve who saw and heard all the same things was still a devil. Why? Because the only one who could choose to exercise his will and bring him forth did not. And so Judas simply remained as he was from the beginning, because in the exercise of his will, God brings us forth through the word of truth. And when God does not exercise his will to bring someone forth, he will remain as he is. I was arguing with a pastor about this, and he said, I want to proclaim a gospel that makes salvation available to all men. I thought about it, and it stuck out that he said, I want, aha, uh -huh. we proclaim what we want. We can't make a scriptural argument against unconditional election, but who cares about that? When we say we want to proclaim a gospel that's this way or that way, then we are choosing, and that is the definition of heresy. Heresy denotes a choosing, a self-willed opinion. I'm only belaboring this because it's the truth. Because God is the one saying it. Jesus is clearly saying it. And you need to know and believe what the Bible is saying so that no one will defraud you of your prize through the philosophy of men. Because that's all the Arminian gospel is, a philosophy of men. A few more verses on this subject of whether God is permitted to have a say over whom he wants to save or not are the following verses. And I certainly would not read them to you if I was after your money. But here they are. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. John 10:39. May be made blind by who? Here's a good one. And he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Mark 4, 11 and 12. Or oh, here's another good one. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded, just as it is also written. God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. Romans 11, 7 and 8. And here's a good one. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were appointed. 1 Peter 2, 8. Or this one. 
The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. 2 Peter 2 9. Or here's one For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Jude verse 4. The point is, God is sovereign over who will be saved and who will not be saved. Peter said, we have come to know that you are the Christ. And Jesus said later that flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. So the glory for somebody being a believer goes 100% to God in heaven and 0% should go to the credit, to the praise or boasting of man. The applications to this doctrine of God's total sovereignty are positive. The truth makes us free free from worrying about losing our salvation for one as it says he that has begun a good work and you will perform it until the day of jesus christ then it's not our job to convert our spouses our relatives or our neighbors jesus said that he will build his church and that all power has been given to him in heaven and on earth so let him then we don't have to feel guilty about not winning too many noah preached for 120 years and won nobody we don't even have to feel like we failed if our children don't believe. If we adequately communicated the truth, that's the end of our responsibility. What's wrong with freedom from guilt, from worry, from inadequacy and fear? Obviously nothing. I am sure Jesus told us all these things for our benefits. I feel totally benefited for knowing this. So after Peter had said to Jesus, we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. Now, just one more principle. Judas is a devil. What does that mean? Well, we can see the new mode of operation for the church age, and that is... The enemy is within. It's by God's sovereign will again. Jesus said, I choose you, the twelve, including the devil, to be on the inside. That's in contrast of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament system. God had said in the Old Testament to kill the false prophets. God told the Jews things like, When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. God told them to kill these people in other scriptures. That's how God protected the purity of the spiritual faith of the individual believer in the Old Testament times. It was an external protection. But by contrast, in the New Testament, God gives the individual internal protection. It's the indwelling Spirit of God. It's like he said, my sheep hear my voice. It's supernatural, it's internal, and it's individual. It's what Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Well, I hope someone will come to know that Jesus alone has the words of eternal life and that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Somehow we will only know this after we have come to know this, as Peter said. And only God can communicate it to whom he wills. Until next time, let those who are heavy pray, and let those who are happy sing. Amen.